to one more for the promises and the conditions for this promises and then I'll dive on I'll dive into the warnings okay so let's turn to Hebrews go to Hebrews 6 19 and yo Hebrews is full of especially the warning passages and we'll be we'll be diving into but Hebrews 6 19 I want you all to listen to this and this is just I really want you all to get this because this is just a let it grip your heart about God and his promises and what he does when he actually makes a promise okay how faithful how much of a faithful God we serve in him for fulfilling his promises if he makes them okay I'll start in verse 13 and I'll read it for when God made a promise to Abraham since he had no one greater by whom to swear he swore by himself saying surely I will bless you and multiply you thus Abraham having patiently waited obtained the promise for people swear by something greater than themselves and in all these disputes in an oath is final for confirmation so when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose he guaranteed it with an oath so that by unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. And this is verse 19. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor for the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So guys, this is saying, that this hope that we have is an anchor for the soul. Okay, and some people I've heard use this as, see, you're anchored. It's an anchor for the soul. And guess what? An anchor can be moved. And so you, you, can't, you can't lose it. This anchor is going to grip your soul. But it's actually saying the anchor that we have should be in the faith, in, in believing a God who makes a promise to those who believe. That's exactly what it's saying. It's saying... God's not a man that he should lie. God is not going to lie. He made a promise. If you believe, you will have eternal life. So guess what? Let that be an anchor for your soul. That, that no one can pluck you out of the Father's hand. That nothing can separate you from the love of, of God that's found in Christ Jesus. All these promises, you are still with the spirit of promise. All these different promises, you'll never hunger, you'll never thirst. He'll raise you up on the last day. He'll give you eternal life. You'll never perish. All these promises will come to fruition if you believe in him. Okay? That is, that is a beautiful promise and that should be an anchor, a hope that is anchored for your soul. And push you to continue in the faith. And... I read the, the last verse. I, was, I didn't really plan to talk about that, but talking about Jesus having become the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And some people say, well, if God's praying for them, could God's prayers fail? And, and they'll use that as, see, he's the high priest. So if he's praying for you, that means you're going you're gonna to be saved. Like God's, Jesus' prayers don't fail. Once you're saved, you're always saved, you're saved because Jesus prays for you. And my response to that is, is, is really simple. Like, Jesus also prayed for unity in John 17. Like, that's that was his prayer. But then, not too many of our churches are unified. And if we are unified, we're unified within, each, within camps. Or within that one, air quotes, body thinking that we're the only body and the other churches around us are not part of the body of Christ. And so we're still striving for that unity that God prayed for because it is not yet obtained. Let heaven come on earth as it is in heaven. Like The reason why he had to pray for that, his will is for heaven to come on earth, but it's not yet on earth. So it, he had to pray for it to come on earth. And so like 
that is God's will and that that is what it, he wants to happen but it it's not just because and I'm not saying that That his his prayers are in ineffective. I think that if if hard prayers can be answered by God, how much more can can Christ? But I, but I still believe that that argument doesn't necessarily hold weight because because we, we're not in unity like we should be, and we, and we should be. And that was that was Jesus' prayer. But at the, at the same time, um, sinful people are messy, and so. That is, that is why uh, I thank God He's continue praying. He's continually praying for us, and that's why we should continue to pray for the lost. That's why we conti should continue to pray for unity within the church as well, and continue not to only pray for it but strive for it. Okay, and <clears throat> and that would be all. I would, I would say for the passages that people would try to use to. Um, there, there's more. I mean, there's there's Philippians one six. Um, he who began a good work on you will be faithful to complete it at the the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and there's there's all these different passages. But but one thing I feel like all these passages have in common. They all beautiful promises, but they're promises to those who believe. Okay, so. That is, that is the key to looking at all these verses that seem to indicate or show that once you're saved, you can never follow, you can never follow away, you can never lose your salvation. Is there's a promise, but there's a stipulation to this promise. And that stipulation in almost every single one of these is you have to abide in Christ, you have to be in Christ, because these, these promises are found in Christ, and how do you become in Christ? You must believe.